And it is by virtue of us human beings that everything we need to do first need to be comprehended. Unless we turn into zombies and then we just go in that circuit, right? And the attempts were made in the horrifying experiments. Of how can one do that? That the human being is there doing something outwardly, fully engaged, seemingly, but in fact, there is nobody home anymore. So this, both the capacity, ability, predisposition, that the no matter how paradoxical and at the very same time, as I said earlier, unfathomably, terrifyingly, extraordinarily, bewilderingly, and so on. Yet, all this is nothing other than. In all its complexity, it's very, very, very simple. But it makes, at the very same time, something, it moves something. And that something that moves is not here to become numb, is not here to become amputated. It has to move. It has to vibrate in response to. And this is what we could say loosely the next stage, next level of understanding of this teaching. The importance of our emotional response, responses in this world which in itself is at once inseparable and indispensable aspect of how Absolute reflects the fullness of its totality in that what from human perspective is always perplexingly and at times horrifying. Mind doesn't want to accept that. Many um, post-war philosophers, particularly in the domain, well, they all, oh, this is this is what postmodernism is characterized, right? Remember that one of the latest reflections? That everything prior to the Second World War was still tinted by the colors of modernity. Modernism was a long, long affair. We could say that modernism started as early as almost the Giotto. as early as 13th century, coming into its heights in the Renaissance, in the height of it, 15th century, going into, alumingly fully into its blast in the time of the Industrial Revolution, accompanied by French Revolution. And all that reverberates into the window that when we enter the 20th century with all these ideas, hopes, that there is indeed a salvation nearby. The most importantly, leaving the God out of the picture in the 19th century, as Nietzsche has suggested, being grown up enough not to have that almighty, heavy, fatherly, paternal figure looking over the shoulder, everything we're doing, approving or disapproving. No, dead. Here I am, standing. What, what's now? All the other breakthroughs in the earliest, earlier decades of the 20th century. The excitement is, it's like exhilaration is an understatement. All these ideas that Hollywood has been regurgitating in the last God knows many years, all of them coming from that time. They don't come from postmodernism. All of them are all the inheritance of the modernism, all these ideas of the hero, larger than life, heroic. And then comes the Second World War. And the thinkers and spiritually oriented beings, even those who had brushed with the eternal, had very difficult time to reconcile that. The atrocities and the horror that collectively we went through. 
that brought the fragmentation and the breakdown of the cherished dream carried throughout the centuries to be fulfilled in the 20th century only to abort it fully. That's what postmodernism is characterized by. And many postmodern thinkers didn't want consciously to go there into that domain of reconciling it all and it had to take quite a few decades. I will tell you that non-duality would not be possible straight in the aftermath of the war. Why do you think that? Precisely because of the sentiment. The sentiment of non-duality would be seen sacrilege in the knowledge of the Holocaust. Yes, exactly that. It would seem a sacrilege. How can that be justified? There's no justification to that. And those who go beyond these confined, confined boundaries, where we can only fragment further and lament, because that's also another distinctive characteristics of postmodernism. Nihilism, irony, lamenting and disregarding, fragmenting further. Fragmenting further, fragmenting further. Nothing is held, nothing no longer shared. You have your truth, I have my truth, you have, you know, 50 more different truths. Nobody shares any truths anymore. So this, what gives that um, maybe still peephole view into the, what we are gathering to. Save. But some of you do remember in more that kind of poised driven, that sweetness driven discourses where we spoke about the what is it all about, what's the purpose of it all. And you remember when the suggestion was made, a reminder or a suggestion that it is to experience it fully. So this is what this is about. So if this is the body of Shiva, that means it's to experience it fully for what it is. And if we are to come into the sovereignty of who we are, then we cannot afford not to experience it fully. The sentiment here is precisely to go fully into the nature of experience even as a spectator. Okay, let's give it another angle. Let's give it another shot. Okay, maybe let's go back to the um, baby food. Let's go back to the chewing it. Right? Let's go back to the that you know. Okay, guacamole. If you don't like the baby food, let's go back to the mushed avocado. You know, when avocado is already soft, but when you want to make it softer, you turn it into a muse. Amrita sometimes adds a spoonful of chocolate there, so it makes it chocolate avocado muse. Remember in Ramayana, when we gave the example of Ramayana, remember we spoke about the only real way of reading Ramayana and that is the way Ramayana is and why Ramayana is considered to be such an important scripture as all scriptures of course but why Ramayana in particular this is the gift also that and also the again that why all this been done 
well before Sigmund Freud, well before Carl Jung and all that. You know, this is what the marvel of Indian civilization is. If you truly understand that, there's no depth to measure, there's no bottom, because it's when you want to the measure of the depth of the Indian civilization, you will end up in a bottomless pit of the void, which will reabsorb you into the heart of it all. But you will never measure the depth of that civilization when it comes to what it came up with. So Ramayana, one of its extraordinary therapeutic level is that by sheer partaking in the narrative of the story of all its characters and as in every epic there are all the roles assigned remember all the roles assigned there are the roles of the real hero and then that role kind of slightly changes because you can also see that Rama at times loses it and loses it badly and you can see that oh my god you know that actually demon can have integrity and behave in a also extraordinary way. There's something admirable about that warrior spirit. The perplexity of the cunningness of the best and the youngest of wives, right? Kaikei, who whispers these evil words into the ear of her husband to ban Rama on the eve of his inauguration. All this, all the way through, you read that, you read that. Something happens to the psyche. Something happens along the way. There are times when you read passages about the demons and their deeds and Asuras and what have you, about this or that encounter. And that brings out aspects of your own personality, aspects of your own being. And by virtue of its being brought to the surface, it has that therapeutic quality to it because it sheds light on the areas which otherwise remained hidden deep in the unconscious. You see? This is why it has so many characters there in the Ramayana. And not all these characters are, they're all given a three-dimensional quality. They're not just given like a flat, cartoon-like, you know, following the James Bond movie kind of. No, that the villain needs to be savored fully so that you almost secretly somehow in danger of actually fancying the demon. When the full description of the prose of the Ravana are being enumerated, it's hard not to kind of like be startled by his achievements. You know, you don't just, and also whenever he puts all these white garments and, right, strong body, scholar of the unparalleled level, subjugated all the devas under his seat, boon from Shiva himself, and the list goes on. So what am I saying is, this is that chocolate muse. This is what is digested. We talked about it when Ramayana was brought as an example. It is that emotional response that is required, because without that emotional response, certain things never brought to the surface. This is why in the true, authentic, integral, spiritual path, closing the door to emotions is on par with becoming a zombie and never really see the light of ultimate reality because that does not exist on its own. This is the body of Shiva. So everything that is ha happening here, everything that is taking place here is not orchestrated somehow through the agency independent. But at the same time, and this is where this what makes it perplexing. So how can we, where do we find ourselves? What, what's, the, what's the purpose of all this? 
that is for you to answer what's the purpose. That is for you to know. Because you will never be able to embody someone else's truth other than your own. There is no other truth, only your own. But it cannot be at the very same time only that portion of truth. Or that what you prefer, because you identified with it for so long, you don't even know yourself outside of this identification. It's so ingrained and the roots of that go so deeply into that what the individuality holding on to for dear life is make it nearly an impossible job. 